Good morning, church. How are we today on this Labor Day weekend, this holiday weekend? It is good to gather together. We invite you in that spirit. Would you stand? Greet somebody near you in the name of Jesus today.
you're joining us here in person or online, whenever you are, wherever you are, we believe that you're in the right place. So together, let's approach this moment with an open heart, with a voice lifted in praise, with a posture of worship to our great and glorious King who is worthy of every hallelujah through the ages. Let's join in that song together today. Let's sing this together.
give a shout of praise to him who is worthy. Sabbath, just ruminating that every week, and our God is good, and that we get to rest in his goodness. Our Jesus is good. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 Yes, he is. Let's proclaim this together. Thank you. 
Sabbath means in our lives. We thank you for the words of Dawn and pray that she touches the lives of all of us as we continue to learn together how to grow in putting Sabbath into our daily life. Thank you for our health, our safety, and the opportunity for us to get to worship you in this building. In your heavenly name we pray. Amen. In that spirit, we invite you to be seated. Well, good morning. My name is Ryan. I'm one of the worship directors here at Good Shepherd. It's my honor and privilege to be gathering in worship with each of you here today because it is good and it is right to gather together to lift the name that is above all names, the name of Jesus Christ. Are you with me on that? Yeah? That's why we're here, for one reason, and that's Jesus. The great thing about Jesus is, though, in his goodness, in his rest that we sing about, that we experience, it's because we're in relationship with Jesus. And he calls us to be in relationship with others as well, too. So whether this is your first time here at Good Shepherd or whether this is your hundredth time here, welcome. We believe that you're in the right place. You're among friends and family here. In the seat backs in front of you, there are some cards. There's ways for us to kind of interact and, and connect together. The white card is what we call a connect card. This is where you let us know who you are, what you're interested in, how we can best partner together to serve and to grow as God pursuers, as relationship builders, as these uh, traits that God puts into each and every one of us. This is how we practice that and put it into play. The yellow card is a prayer card. We want to be partnering and joining together in prayer, supporting each other, whether they're prayers of praise and thanksgiving, whether they're prayers of times of need. We want to make sure that we're, God, that we're pursuing God together in prayer for each other, supporting each other. Are you with me on that? Last week, we celebrated what we call a Better Together Sunday. Really, every Sunday is Better Together, am I right? But uh, last week in particular, we called it Better Together Sunday. We've been doing them throughout the summer. Last week, we gathered together to pack refugee, uh, pack care packages for Ukrainian refugees. And we used collections that you guys provided, toothbrushes, soap, uh, bars of soap. And we packed them together, and we're sending them off through Lutheran World Relief to refugees from the Ukraine. And here's the good news, friends. Over 175 people went down in the activities uh, service to serve yet last week. Let's, let's thank God for that. If that was you, thank you for your time and for your service. That was like roughly like a little over around 40% of everyone that came to worship last week stayed to serve. Come to worship, stay to serve. Um, and we packed over 1,000 kits. We crushed our goal. And, and the good news is, as well, we have leftover supplies. We're going to be packing 500 more to send on the way um, a little bit later. So stay tuned for more information about that, updates about that. But we are truly better together. So thank you for your serving. Thank you for your being generous givers. As God calls us to be gener generous givers, to grow in generosity, because he is first generous to us. We want to take this next moment of service to respond with generosity through our ties, through our offerings. And the cool thing is we get to hear a pretty pretty neat story about uh, an amazing ser servant here at Good Shepherd. Her name's Amy Beagleman. Her husband, Keith, is the bass player, one of the bass players in our, on our worship team. Check out this story of Amy and how she offers her time. My name is Amy Beagleman, and I've been at Good Shepherd, I think, four years. So I am married um, uh, to Keith Beagleman, and I have two adult daughters. We had been to Good Shepherd as visitors many times. Um, our niece was baptized here. Um, so we had been here before just as guests. Um, and my husband and I needed a new place to grow. And so we went to many um, churches in the area I was resistant to Good Shepherd because it was so large, but we felt welcomed right away. And so um, we started attending, and then my husband became part of the worship band. And he, he was at home in the worship band, and so we knew that this would be the place that we would settle. At Good Shepherd, I have served um, in the Family Ministries program as an Early Childhood Sparks leader. I am part of the Marriage Ministry team at Good Shepherd and just recently have added the incredible privilege of serving communion in the Worship Center since we've brought that back post-COVID. 
When we decided to make Good Shepherd our home, we went to um, the new member luncheon and we had been given the opportunity to kind of put our areas of interest on a form and we talked about children's ministries here at Good Shepherd and what it looked like. I've never done early childhood, but someone encouraged me to try it. I've always done a little bit older and I really did not think I was gonna like it. I, I thought they were gonna be too little for me and it was, that is not the case. I love being early childhood Sparks leader here. My responsibility in Sparks is to bring the lesson to the little ones. And so we play games, I, you know, I lead games, I, I keep everyone safe, I, I get the Bible story out there, and I think my biggest responsibility is that all the children leave knowing that Jesus loves them and that church is a really fun place to be. Um, I have made Good Shepherd my church home. And just like home ownership, you take care of the responsibilities. So in home ownership, there's chores that you do. There is nothing in children's ministry that's a chore to me. It is pure joy. So that's why I want to serve in that area. Um, I think if this is our home, we take care of the things that are important to us. I would tell you that there is incredible joy in bringing the gifts that God has given you to this home. So when God and I work together with the gifts He has given me, He guides me to use those in certain arenas. The outcome is just pure happiness. So try it. <laughs>
Well, you know what? I'm just no, because I'm not. I know you're not. We're kind of all in this big pot of this big mess together. So what we're going to do, though, today is we're going to do this final dive into Sabbath. And I know everybody's just itching to find out how to do it. That's what Pamela and I talked about. Now I sit next to her in the, in the office. And she said, everybody came up, and not everybody, but many people came up and said, wow, I get it, but now how do we do it? Well, you're going to have to wait just, a, you know, about 20 minutes or so. We'll, we'll get to that in a second because here's the thing. There's one more tidbit, one more tidbit that you have got to grasp to reap the benefits of Sabbath, of true Sabbath. So, one more thing before the prescription. All right, we've learned that in God's creation, he took time to rest, right? And this wasn't a gateway to idleness. No, this was resting from a work that had been completed. And it wasn't because he was tired. I mean, do you think God really gets tired? No, no, I mean, come on, he's God. There's something more to this. It, he rested because he was instituting this framework, this rhythmic cycle intended for all of humanity. This is important to understand because it gives us insight into what this rest really means and how to practice it. So today, I'm going to take you over to Luke, and we're going to take a look at chapter 6. So let's check out our scripture for today. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and his disciples began to pick some heads of grain. They rubbed them in their hands, and they would eat the kernels. Some of the Pharisees asked, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered them, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He, he entered the house of God and taking the consecrated bread, he ate what was lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave, him, gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and was teaching and a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to uh, accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew what they were thinking and said to the man with the shriveled hand, get up and stand in front of everyone. So he got up and stood there. And then Jesus said to them, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil? to save life or to destroy it. He looked around at them all and then said to the man, stretch out your hand. He did so and his hand was completely restored. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were furious and they began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. Here ends our scripture for this morning. Will you pray with me? Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your people. I thank you for your church. I thank you for your Sabbath. Lord, as we are here this morning together, whether in person or online, may your spirit just rest upon us. May our hearts and our minds be receptive to hear what it is that you have to say to us. In your son's name I pray, amen. All right, well, here we go. So recently, I don't know what brought this on, but my kids and I started talking about uh, rest, and then, but mainly we started talking, I brought up the fact that the TV used to turn off, and they were like, huh? All right, how many of you remember that the TV would go off at night? If you, yeah, okay, come on. I mean, this is what would happen, at least here in the Chicagoland area. I remember because it was special, right? It was especially when I was little. If I got to stay up until the TV turned off, and I don't mean by my mother, I mean like it went out, it was a fun night, right? So for those of you who are younger, we would get to stay up and we'd watch, you know, like creature features and all kinds of stuff, you know, like that. It was super scary. And then what would happen is the national anthem would come on. And then from there, these lines, these horizontal lines would go across the screen, and then, 
Remember? Right? Even the TV rested back then, right? <laughs> Even the TV rested back then. <laughs> but today, what do we have? Today, the malls are open, TV runs 24-7, banks are still closed, but, but you can get money on Sundays and even in some churches have ATMs. Crazy, right? Our kids have sports, restaurants, you name it, it's going, and we would be hard-pressed to find something that doesn't actually rest on Sundays. Everything just goes and goes and goes in the great quest for material prosperity. Well, looking at our text, Luke tells us the story of Jesus reaping grain and, and eating it with his disciples, which would have actually been uh, forbidden on the Sabbath. But did you notice that Jesus didn't say, hey, listen, I came to do away with the Sabbath. No, he didn't say that at all, right? What he said was, I am Lord of the Sabbath. I, I'm all about the Sabbath. And we're going to unpack this a little bit in a few minutes. So as I was preparing for my sermon today, I do a lot of research and studying and so on and so forth, I came across this 20-year-old article. Honest to goodness, it's as relevant today as it was 20 years ago. And it was written by Judith Shulovitz, who was a writer for the New York Times. And her, idol, her, excuse me, her article was titled, Bring Back the Sabbath. And in the article, uh, she begins by giving a little background on herself. She was raised in a religious Jewish community. She attended synagogue in her younger years, but then uh, moved away from her religion as she grew older. And then she writes in this article that she experienced something that she called a phenomenon. And here's what she writes. It's kind of long, so hang with me. She writes, I developed a full-blown weekend disorder. Perhaps because I am Jewish, it came on Friday night. My mood would darken until by Saturday afternoon, I'd be unresponsive and morose. My normal routine made me feel impossibly restless. I started spending Saturdays by myself. After a while, I got lonely and did something that I could never have imagined wanting to do. I began dropping by or dropping in to a nearby synagogue. Finally, I developed a theory for my condition. If formerly people suffered from the Sabbath, meaning all the rules and regulations, I was now suffering from the lack thereof. She goes on, she continues, and she says, there is ample evidence that our relationship to work is out of whack. Most people mistakenly believe that all you have to do to stop working is not work. The inventors of the Sabbath understood that, that it was much more complicated undertaking than this. You cannot downshift casually and easily. And this is why the Puritan and Jewish Sabbaths were so exactingly intentional, requiring extensive, advanced preparation. Interrupting the ceaseless round of striving requires a surprisingly strenuous act of will, one that has to be bolstered by habit as well as by social sanction. Okay, I know that was a lot, so let me just break it down. What she's saying is that our relationship to work is so seriously off the kilter that anyone who thinks that they can gain rest by, you know, knocking off early when tired is actually naive. The ability to rest deeply is a matter of life and death. And no one can do without it, right? We have to have sleep. We have to have rest. But it isn't natural to get this deep rest, and it certainly isn't easy. It takes discipline, it, it takes purposefulness, and it takes practice. So why do you think? Well, I got to thinking about some trends that have been going on in the United States for quite some time, and there's a bunch, and I'm not going to dive deep into them, but I'm going to just list them. Here, here they are. Number one, job insecurity, right? 
make a profit or hit the road. That's pretty much uh, how the work world is. Number two, job expectations in, relationship to, in relation to time. Now think about this. Back in the day when I was a kid, you know, my dad, you know, maybe someone, one of the, those in the higher echelon of the company would make, you know, 10 to 20 times more than what my father would make. But today, today those that are up on the higher echelon, they make 100 times, maybe even 200 times. So what does that mean? That means that they work pretty much 24-7. That means they don't get any rest. That means they are expected to work day in and day out to bust their hump. Number three, technology. Don't we love our technology? Yeah, technology. It, it gives us the ability to work anywhere we want. We really found that out during COVID, didn't we? But guess what? It also means that we work everywhere. So not just anywhere, but we work everywhere. And lastly is identity. We used to gather or garner our, our identity through our family and through God, but today it's actually through our work and what we do. So what does this mean? Well, one, two, and three means that we don't have the time to rest, and number four means that we don't have the ability to rest. It's just crazy. Think about it. It's nuts. And no wonder we are anxious and depressed and angry and totally stressed out. This trend, you know what? It stinks. It stinks. And it's making us sick and it's pulling us further away from God. So as aggravating as all of this is, there's this an abiding human problem that needs to be addressed. And I think this is how Sabbath can actually help us. Going back to the article by Judith, she adds, when the Sabbath was still sacred, not only did drudgery give way to festivity, family gatherings and occasional worship, but the, I want you to hear this, but the machinery of self-reproach shut down too, stilling the eternal inner murmur of self-reproach. Read it one more time. I know it's kind of, you know, like out there. The machinery of self-censorship shut down to stilling the eternal murmur of self-reproach. So what's she talking about? Well, I think if we take a look at sleep, this might help us understand what she's getting at. So sleep experts will tell you that we have a need for deep sleep, right? We call it REM. REM sleep is needed for true rest. You know, so you cannot just take like eight one-hour naps throughout the day and feel your best, right? Like take an hour, get up, do some stuff, take another hour. Get... No, you're going to feel lousy, especially the next day, right? What we need is actual deep rest. REM rest. So it's not necessarily how the amount of sleep or how much sleep you're getting. What's most important is the depth of sleep that you are getting. And here's the point. On one hand, we have this external work that requires rest from exertion, but there is this deeper problem. There, there's a work underneath the work. It's the eternal inner murmur, the machinery of self-censorship. And it's not guilt. It isn't. You know what it is? It's the need to prove yourself. Prove yourself to yourself. Prove yourself to your boss, to your friends, and even to God. How many of you like Rocky? We're going to do some throwbacks today. Rocky fans, come on, for sure. Number one, totally an awesome movie, right? And if you remember Rocky, uh, there's a point in the movie, you know, he's doing all this work, and he's running, and he's doing the stairs, and he's just, right, he's working, working, working. And someone says to him, why are you working so hard, Rock? He answers, I want to go the distance, then I'll know I'm not a bum. He's driven by the eternal inner 
murmur of self-reproach. And you know what? This kind of work, th this work, it makes everything just incredibly weary because it's never enough. It's, it's just never enough. And that is why Sabbath is so important. It's the REM of the soul. And if you don't get it, you're going to suffer. Vacations won't help. Retirement won't help. Money won't help. Even relationships won't help. Because you haven't found the deep rest of the soul. We need Sabbath rest. All right, so we're going to look back at our text again. And here we see that the religious leaders accused Jesus, what? He was violating the Sabbath by picking the grain and eating it. And what does Jesus do? I love that Jesus does this stuff. He seems like he goes off on like squirrel, you know, like you're like, whoa, wait, did, where did he go? What's he talking about? Because here's how he says. He, he says, uh, he starts by talking about David and his friends eating the bread from the tabernacle. You're like, what? what? And, and that only priests were allowed to eat. And here Jesus, he, he takes an incident from the Old Testament when David was running from his, for his life and he enters the tabernacle because he and his guys, are, they're hungry, and they go into the holy place where the bread of presence was, which was set apart for the Sabbath worship and only to be handled and eaten uh, by the priests, and they, you weren't allowed to eat it. So Jesus says, yeah, but David and his friends ate it, and guess what? Jesus says he's implying here that David was never, you know, reprimanded for this. He was never condemned by God for this. So what exactly does all of this have to do with breaking the Sabbath? Well, if the Sabbath and worship regulations can be set aside in a pinch, but there's nowhere else in the, nowhere in the Bible when moral regulations can be set aside, like, you know, committing adultery or stealing or murder, uh, what does this actually mean? It means that they were provisional, that they were actually temporary, meaning they will end when something else comes along to make them obsolete, which is why Jesus responds, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. I am the one that all those regulations pointed to. I am the Lord of rest. So you know what this means, right? It means one of two things. First, if you need rest, you need to go to Jesus. That's the first thing. The second is it, it, that if you've gone to him and you don't feel rest, then you don't really understand what you have. Hebrews 4, 9 to 10, this is what a lot of our series was on, was Hebrews, was all of it was on actually. And let's take a look at 9 to 10. It says here, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did for did from his. Just as God did from his. This is incredible. So let me break this down for you. What's being said here is that you can look at your life and your work in the same way that God looked at his and you can say, it is good. It is good. All the work I needed to do is finished. I know, I know a lot of you are going, what? You should see my desk. Like, I've got piles of paper this high. I have, my to-do list is, like, out of this world. Let's go back to Judith's article for some insight. She writes, not even our group leisure activities can do for us what Sabbath rituals could once be counted on to do. Because rituals do not exist simply to promise togetherness. They're designed to convey to us a certain story about who we are. The story told by the Sabbath is that of creation. We rest because God rested. 
What leads from God to humankind is the notion of the divine in us. We rest to honor the divine in us to remind ourselves that there is more to us than our vocation or what we do during the week. To a great degree, <laughs> Judith summed up what the Hebrew writers were saying. Remember, there are two kinds of work. You've got the physical, external work that you do day to day, but then you have that internal work of the soul. And you know, friends, it, it's not the physical work that makes us weary. It, it, seriously, you can just look back to Genesis, right? You can look back to the garden, to paradise. There was work to do. God gave Adam and Eve work to do. So it's not the presence of work. It's the absence of rest that makes us weary. And Jesus, who is the Sabbath, is the only one who can give you the rest that you seek. Remember, he said, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And what Jesus means is that everybody is serving something. We pine away searching for our identity. But it is only through Jesus where we will find meaning and rest. Only through Jesus will you be able to look at your work and be satisfied. How is this possible? Well, here's how. Going back to Luke, we saw in the text that the, the leaders were furious, right? They were furious that Jesus broke the Sabbath, and they began uh, discussing what they were going to do with Jesus, right? Well, why were they furious? Do you know what it means to say, I am the Lord of the Sabbath? He was saying he was God. That's what got him in trouble. That's what got them so angry. So they decided they'd have to kill him, right? But guess what? And this is such a plot twist. That made him the Lord of the Sabbath. Killing him made him the Lord of the Sabbath. Now look at the cross. What's happening on the cross? We see Jesus, he's writhing in pain, right? He cries out to God, why have you forsaken me? And why is Jesus so restless? Two verses, Isaiah 57, 20. The wicked are like the tossing sea which cannot rest, whose ways cast up mire and mud. There is no peace for the wicked. And then 2 Corinthians 5, 21. On the cross, God made him to be sin who knew no sin that we may become the righteousness of God in him. This is incredible. Looking at the cross, we see Jesus crying out and writhing in pain because he is experiencing that infinite restlessness of the wicked. He's separated for that moment from his father and he's experiencing this restlessness and there is no rest for those who turn from God. Look at our world, which is the whole point of why he died. What did he say in the end when he gave up his spirit? What did he say? It is finished. It is finished. What's finished? What's finished? Everything necessary for salvation for that most perfectionistic, eternal inner murmur. Do you see it? I hope you do. So in other words, Jesus, he came to live the life we should have lived and he died the death that you and I should die so that we could receive salvation. Now, what is salvation anyway? Well, it's knowing that we rest on his finished work, 
not our own. It is that work that was done so that when God looks at us, he can say, it is good. He is good. She is good. Now, we're going to get to the how. But you've got to grasp all of this that I just told you to do the how. Anything you do to practice uh, Sabbath before understanding what I just taught you won't work. Vacations don't tackle the deep rem of the soul. All right, so back to Luke again. The last thing we see in the text is Jesus healing a man on the Sabbath, right? And according to Jewish law, you could heal someone if they were dying, but you couldn't do this. Like, you couldn't just heal a shriveled hand. That, that was not allowed. So Jesus, what does he do? He breaks the Sabbath again. But this time he says, is it lawful to do good or to do evil on the Sabbath? Again, I love this. Jesus just kind of goes, and you're like, what? Right? So in other words, what he's saying is, I'm doing what I should be doing on the Sabbath which is restorative. I'm restoring the shriveled. What Jesus is also implying is that because he is the Sabbath, we do not need to live by all of those strict regulations of the law. But here's, here's a little bad news from us for us. There's a, there's a bit of a problem here. We don't have rules and regulations to, to follow so the problem, that, that actually is the problem, right? Because now we have freedom to do whatever we want, right? We don't have the rules, so we're in more danger because Christians, as Christians, because there aren't rules. It's going to take dedication. It's going to take persistence. It's going to take planning and practice. Because if you don't, the world will whisk you away into the swirl of never-ending busyness, futility, and emptiness. Practicing Sabbath is restorative. All right, kids, this one's for you if anybody fell asleep. What is the thing that you look forward to most living in the Chicagoland area in January and February on a school day? What? A snow day. Why do you want a snow day? You get off of school. That's right, you cheated. <laughs> not right, not anymore. Oh, I know, gosh. But now I'm really, no, this was just until COVID, right? So they always want a snow day. And we wanted snow days. Why? What did a snow day do for you? Remember, you get up really early and you'd go to the TV and the house was still dark and you'd turn it on and you'd wait as the scroll would come up and you'd look for your school and then bingo, there it is. And then what would you do? Yay, you'd party on back to your bed and go to sleep. You'd sleep in, you'd have the time of your life, you could do whatever you wanted, right? Well, guess what? That's Sabbath. Sabbath is a holy snow day. And... God gives you 52 of them. So how do you like that? All right? <laughs> kind of fun, right? Okay, so here's your prescription, friends. According to the Bible, Sabbath is an act of liberation. We can look at Deuteronomy 15 where it says, Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that I brought you out with a mighty hand. Therefore, observe the Sabbath. You see, slaves didn't work, or excuse me, slaves didn't get a day off. And if you don't rest, you're a slave. And I'm not talking about the work for income only. A lot of you can't say no. You're overcommitted and always busy, and you can't set time aside. So your slavery may be self-imposed, but nonetheless, you are still a slave. It may be because of our insecurities. It may be because of our family's hopes and dreams. It may be our culture's expectations. 
whatever it is, it's keeping us in bondage. And you need to say no as an act of liberation. You need to say, none of what I am doing defines me. Not how many clients I have or how much money I make. Not the volunteering I do nor the expertise I have. I am not defined by any of it. I'm taking time off to practice Sabbath. And think about it. The Bible says, you are not a slave, so don't be a slave. Sabbath is also an act of trust. It's pretty much just knowing that you are not God. <laughs> you are not God, and that you can trust that he has your back. So, Here's my little layout for you. Here we're getting to the how, what you've been waiting for. You're like, yay. All right, here's some ideas for you. First, you got to plan. You have to plan. That's what the Jewish, you know, faith, that's what they did. That's what the Puritans did. They planned. You're going to pick your day, probably Sunday for most of us, but it might be another day because some people like pastors and teachers of the word work on Sundays, right? So it might have to be a different day. So pick a day. Make sure all of your chores and your errands and your cleaning and all of that is done the day before. Then, this is, the, is going to be a hard one, you're going to unplug. Ugh. The world will not come to end, I promise. You're going to unplug. Now some of you may need to do a half a day to start out. Just take it slow, right? Unplug at sundown. Turn off those cell phones. Put those tablets away. Put them in a drawer and let your family and friends know. Don't bug me unless it's an emergency, right? Light some candles. I don't know. Eat at home. Unwind over a glass of wine. Read or maybe even do a puzzle. Talk. Visit. Chill out with your friends. Next, you're going to have some unplanned time. To practice this, the, the first two were internal. The, the, the next or the external, you're going to have some unplanned time. This means doing whatever comes to your mind and heart. No alarm, sleep in, roll out of bed, make yourself breakfast, you know, linger over the newspaper, say some prayers, whatever you do. When striving ceases, it fills your soul. Next, you're going to have some contemplative time. The Bible, you know, it requires, it tells them, hey, we got to worship. We have to observe the Sabbath with, by worshiping together. But that's not all that we should do. We need to pray and have solitude and journaling and reading and, and reflection. These are all, you know, um, crucial ways that we can replenish our inward soul in Christ. Next is avocational time. An avocation is something that is fun for you, uh, that you enjoy doing, that takes a little skill or expertise. Usually it's something that other people might do for a living, like carpentry or fishing or cooking or whatever it is, whatever floats your boat. And here's where you get to enjoy God's finished work. Next, aesthetic time. Aesthetic time. In Genesis, God viewed all that he created and said, it is good. Oh, so why don't you go enjoy it? Take a walk. Enjoy the scenery. Listen to music or experience some form of art where you can sit back and go, that is so good. That is so good. And lastly, nurture relationships. God made us relational. In my family, we have Sunday family dinner together. That's a part of how we practice Sabbath. It's been a way of our life for 35 years now. Sunday is the Lord's Day, and it's family day. Even then when our, my kids were growing up and there were sports on Sundays, we made sure to have dinner as a family. So friends, when 
you go from this place today, I want you to begin brainstorming what works for you and your family. On your ride home, just start brainstorming. What will you do? How will you do Sabbath? The only person's eyes you should have to prove yourself to looks at you now and says, it is finished. And it is good. Let that sink in. Let's pray. Friends, isn't it good to hear God's word? Lord, we thank you that you just speak to us through the pages of your word, that you are a personal God, not a distant God, and that you loved us so much that you not only created Sabbath, but that you are the Sabbath. We thank you, Lord, and we love you. In your son's name I pray, amen. Well, friends, as we get ready to come to the table, we need to spend a little time in confession. Would you stand with me as we do a corporate prayer together? You know, it is through confession where we receive God's grace. It's such a beautiful thing, shall we? Holy and merciful God, in your presence we confess our sinfulness, our shortcomings, and our offenses against you. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. Have mercy on us, O Lord, for we are ashamed and sorry for all we have done to displease you. Forgive our sins and help us to live your light and walk in your ways. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior, amen. confess to the Lord the ways that we've got that wrong. And as we approach the table where we receive his body, his blood for the forgiveness of our sins, we experience true grace and true peace. It's always a pleasure to share this, that we've confessed and hear this good news that through the blood of Jesus, our sins are forgiven. In making peace with God, we're also called to make peace with others. So the last few weeks, we've been doing a little practice from more traditional church um, experiences, and it's a practice called passing the peace. And it's where we have made peace with God, but now we are to make peace with others. 
that are around us, passing and extending the peace that God gives us through Christ. So in just a moment, we want this to be a messy moment, so don't stay where you are. We need you to walk around the room, find somebody that's not near you, and greet them, and or sorry, pass the peace of, of Christ to them. You can say something as simple as, may the peace of Christ be with you. And we receive that peace, and we offer it back, and we say, and also with you. If you have a family member, you can give them a hug, a little kiss, a pinch on the cheek or the rear. And um, if, it's a, if it's a friend or congregation member, just give them a high five or a, or a, a handshake. Don't recommend the rear pinch. But it's in that spirit of relationships that we do this. And we understand this might be uncomfortable for some. We acknowledge that. But that doesn't mean we aren't to do it. We're supposed to take steps of faith and grow in relationship. So let's take this next moment to do that. Well, that's fun, isn't it? It's getting less and less awkward each week, don't you think? That's not awkward for me. I grew up Catholic, so it's very, very normal. So, All right, friends, as we come to the table, you know, to be a, a Sabbath keeper, this is what Pastor Glenn said, so I'm repeating it because I liked it so much. To be a Sabbath keeper is to follow Jesus and lay things down. When we come to the table where Jesus says, lay it down. Lay, lay down your striving. Lay down your eternal inner murmur of self-reproach. Lay it down. This is the place you can do it. You know, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was at the table with his disciples and he took the bread, the Passover bread, and said, take, he broke it and said, take all of you and eat this, for this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after dinner, he took the cup of wine. He looked at his friends and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant shed for you and for all so that your sins may be forgiven. Drink in remembrance of me. Friends, Jesus invites all of us to the table you come share in that meal together and as you do when our servers come up you are going to be offered a wafer you can hold out your hand be given to you you can dip it into the red which is wine or the white which is grape juice friends join us as we come together to eat
Servers may come up. Oh, geez, Louise, I forgot to say. Good golly. That's it. Do you see? I'm fired already. Oh, my goodness. Let's pray the prayer that the Yes, Lord thank us you. <laughs> Our Father, who, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed Amen. be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, friends, all joking aside, please come and share at the table. body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of the Sabbath, be with you, strengthen you, and give you peace. Friends, go ahead and stand with me as we continue to offer our lives as sacrifices, holy and pleasing to our God. Our God is a God of transformation, and may our understanding of Sabbath be made new as we continue to sing of his goodness, and that there is no one like our God, Amen. Amen. I search the world.
of, you know, communion, the most important part of the whole service, I did it live streamed forever to be shared to the world. Good golly. Forgive me. This is why we need grace, right? This is why we need grace. All right. Benediction. I'm going to read it right here from Hebrews chapter 13. Now may the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Hey, friends, as you leave this place, take Jesus with you. But one more thing. Check it out. Have a good weekend.
everybody.